back in space. And you can get all kinds of nice patterns. It can be static or it can be moving. You can get all kinds of well, spots and stripes. Um, as well as spirals that move and waves. And because well, these processes, these feedback processes are quite general, you see this kind of pattern everywhere in natural systems. For instance, um, the formation of sand dunes, combination of feedbacks, um, tropical cyclones are created by positive feedback mostly, um, ice ages are driven by feedbacks, you get well, oscillations in the climate, and um, well, the spots, of stripes, spots and stripes of some organisms are thought to be created by combinations of positive and negative feedback during development. Um, Neural patterns are, of course, created by feedbacks, as well as, um, well, gene networks. Gene networks are the interactions between genes, basically, and they contain lots of feedback loops. This, these are a few example, uh, examples of real parts of networks. Um, no, the development of plants and animals are, is thought to be driven by feedback to a large extent. And, of course, uh, the ant foraging has a large feedback component. And even the social structure of, um, well, for instance, monkeys or uh, bee or bumblebee colonies um, has feedback processes which determine the, the social hierarchy. Okay, so um, just as energy provides the thermodynamic driving force behind structure and organization, feedback processes provide one of the main pattern generating mechanisms. Um, in fact, you could, you could consider uh, natural selection itself to be a kind of uh, amplification by positive feedback. And, well, there's also negative feedback, uh, of course. Um, and so these Feedback things create um, a lot of the, the structure um, on which evolution can then act. But it's not enough to get multicellular organisms. Uh, as Alan Turing himself once said, or is said to have said, regarding a zebra, um, the stripes are easy, but the horse part is a bit harder to explain. Okay, so the next piece of our puzzle um, involves relationships between replicators, that is, things that replicate, things that uh, copy themselves. I guess you could call such relationships feed forward instead of feedback, but the term is usually used for uh, other uh, things, so I won't use it. Um, well, the nature of this di these dissipative uh, structures, systems, makes that it's quite easy to get um, food chains. Um, where was I? Oh yeah. The energy from the sunlight can be degraded along the food chain. Um, well, this is a classic one where uh, energy is converted into uh, plants, basically. Then the plants are eaten by uh, all kinds of uh, animals that eat other animals. And in the end, you have not a lot of the energy left, of the original energy. That's why they have to eat a lot. Um, and at each step, about 90% of the energy is lost. So it's a, it's a, it's a real dissipative uh, system. And actually, well, at the end, the, the animal at the end is converted back into matter by all kinds of decomposing organisms. And usually these changes are not as simple as this. They're a bit more difficult. Uh, this is a simplified version of a of an uh, oceanic food web. Okay. Um, well, apart from these kind of eating and being eaten relationships, uh, we also have competitive interactions, for instance. It's, well, this is also kind of negative feedback, but uh, you can, for instance, have competition for uh, space, for light, um, 
And this is actually the main driver behind natural selection because, well, uh, the one that does best has the most space or the most light or the most food and then uh, over time it dominates the ones that, uh, that don't have that. Which means that they cannot exist in equilibrium. The question is if there is equilibrium, of course, but... Well. Um, there are lots of other relationships. Bio biologists like to give them uh, all kinds of difficult names like mutualism, commensalism, amensalism, and a few other isms. Um, and these basically include all the ways that one organism can influence another organism other than for food um, or for space. Um, and believe it or not, these are actually interesting for a number of reasons. And the first reason is that you can see a lot of these relationships in nature between uh, all kinds of uh, things. You can get them between, uh, for instance, molecules that well, they can have positive or negative influence on each other. You see a lot of these interactions in bacteria, for instance. Um, and you can even get such relationships in uh, communities of digital organisms. A well-known example is uh, the virtual world Terra which was created in the early 90s by uh, what's he called? Tom, Thomas Ray, who was a, a tropical ecologist. And there are some derivatives of this, such as uh, Avida. And, um, well, Chera is basically a virtual world, uh, a virtual machine, actually, in which uh, small assembly programs can run and compete for memory. You can see a memory map here, and for CPU cycles. And within a few thousand generations, you can get all kinds of uh, dependence relationships between these uh, programs. Um, for instance, you can get parasites, you can get mutualists, you can get uh, hyperparasites that, well, are parasites for parasites. And when you turn mutation off, you can even, they sort of even invent a kind of sexual, sexual re uh, reproduction. Um, so the kind of relationships and processes you see in living systems can also appear in systems that are not actually living, which is interesting. Well, interesting as well is um, the simulations that are performed at a group where I study. Um, this is one by Nobuto Takeuchi. <laughs> uh, and he's trying to simulate the early stages of molecular evolution uh, by basically mutating virtual strings of RNA and then calculating how they fold in two dimensions and then letting them interact. And, um, well, even in such a fairly simple system, you can get all kinds of, um, of interactions. Well, a few, anyway. <laughs> um, so he gets sort of a basic ecosystem with two species and two parasites. And, well, that's where the, this stripped down version of, of RNA. An actual RNA molecule uh, as a three-dimensional structure so could do a lot more than these uh, things. Okay, so in, um, well, in evolving systems that offer the possibility of relationship between things that replicate, you can easily get all kinds of interactions uh, and relationships. And each interaction may then create probabilities, uh, possibilities for new interactions. And, uh, well, they may lead to quite complex networks of interactions, like the food web you saw, uh, you saw before. Um, so, basically, complexity in this case creates more complexity. Okay, so besides being a natural form of complexity, there is another reason why these relationships are interesting, and that is um, they can help explain some of the increasing, uh, mostly hierarchical complexity you see in replicating systems over time, for instance in organisms. Single cell to multicell organisms and, um, well, then multicell organisms getting more complex. And the basic mechanism is that some relationships may prove beneficial, so things, well, having two things does better than having just one, and then it can get selected for. So you basically get a new level of selection, 
and well, they can get combined into a single organization level. Um, I will give a few examples. For instance, um, a very concrete example is in our own cells. Um, we call these eukaryotic cells to distinguish them from the simpler prokaryotic cells, which uh, are, for instance, bacteria and also the, the more primitive forms of life. Um, and they have all kinds of structures inside that perform all kinds of specialist tasks. For instance, there's the, the cell nucleus that holds the, the DNA and other uh, genetic material. There's the mitochondrium, which helps, um, well, helps oxidize all kinds of m uh, food molecules. And um, there's the chloroplasts in plants, which uh, well, do photosynthesis, basically. So they provide energy through converting sunlight. Um, and there is quite a lot of genetic evidence that these structures were all once free-living single-cell organisms. And they, well, they were specialized at something, or they became specialized at something, and they started living together with bigger cells. And in the end, they probably, um, well, became a new organism. So, although the selection uh, initially acted on, well, separate cells, um, the reproduction of the collection of all these cells became more important uh, after a while, and it turned into a new level of organization. Well, you can also get these new levels of organization as a result of uh, a bit more unexpected side effects of all kinds of interactions. Um, a nice example is this one. Um, this is a computer model of Maarten Boerleist and Pauline Hogeweg from 1991. And they basically simulated uh, hypercycles, that are cycles of, well, basically replicators, repl replicating molecules that um, can catalyze each other's formation. So you can get a cycle of things that catalyze each other. Well, when you put these in a spatial grid, uh, in this case a cellular automaton grid, um, well, you get that they start to catalyze each other and they form, they organize into spirals so they can easily reach each other. And it then turns out that these spirals, uh, well, it, they sort of become dependent on the, on the spirals instead of their own uh, rep replication speed. Because you get um, selection between spirals. Um, because these spirals, um, well, they start to compete for space, space is only limited. And who has the biggest spiral becomes uh, the selection criterion, basically. And of course, this still depends on, uh, on properties of these molecules, but, well, um, the spirals have formed a new type of organization and selection. Okay, you might have noticed that um, the creation of such new levels of organization uh, it will lead to more or less a hierarchical form of organization. So each organization level can be composed of um, well, simpler entities, which in turn are formed by even simpler entities, etc. But still all these levels influence each other. And um, each level adds well, a bit more complexity and a bit more things that can be modified by evolution. And, well, that's what we see in nature, basically. Molecules that form into cells, and cells that form into all kinds of tissues, and then form into organisms, populations, uh, communities of populations, whatever. And, in the end, you have the entire biosphere. Okay, let's return for a moment to uh, these replicating molecules that were around about 4 billion years ago, 4.3 billion years ago. Um, well, a collection of these uh, replicating molecular systems probably formed the first cells about 3.5 billion years ago. And fairly soon these started to live together in filaments um, and in communities and in well, some more intimate forms of uh, organization, like the 
eukaryotic cell uh, things. 